Ladies and gentlemen, a couple of days ago, news emerged that the X570 platform, along with presumably the Ryzen 3000 series of processors, would be launching at Computex 2019. This news emerged from the website gamer.com. .tw, and supposedly the X570 platform would also support PCIe 4.0. Well, since this news broke, I was actually contacted by a source. Now, I can reveal not the source's name or the company he works for, but believe me, they definitely do work with a company which uh, has direct ties to AMD. They are one of their partners. I cannot reveal more information because obviously that would be very unfair to the person whom I spoke with. But he revealed to me exclusively that yes, this is indeed true. The slide that we saw was accurate and AMD are targeting both the uh, Ryzen 3000 series processors along with the X570 platform to release at the Computex 2019 timeframe. He also revealed various other information. One of the things that I also learned would, is that we would be seeing support for USB 3.2. This would of course double the transfer speeds compared to the currently supported USB 3.1, which is a nice addition for sure and will obviously benefit people who plug in a lot of devices into the system and require a high transfer speeds. I also learned that in terms of DDR4 support, AMD officially are aiming to target DDR4 3200 MHz. Of course, just like always, your mileage will certainly vary depending upon the RAM kit you have. It's possible that you might be able to put in RAM kit and perhaps go for 3600 or what have you, but the minimum speed that they are targeting to officially support is 3200 MHz. It is also still going to remain dual channel memory. So they are not increasing it to tri-channel memory or quad-channel memory or anything like that. It's still going to be DDR4 uh, 3200 MHz. Uh, in regards to memory as well, AMD are said to be beefing up the validation and testing of memory kits. If you recall back to when the original Ryzen 1000 series of processors launched, it was a real crapshoot of, is my memory going to work with Ryzen? So for example, you could have two sets of crucial memory. One might be like 3000 megahertz, one might be 3200 megahertz, and you can actually get the 3200 megahertz to a slower clock speed than the 3000 megahertz memory. And obviously as AMD updated the uh, BIOSes and Agasa code, this is improved. And this works a little differently to what uh, happens with Intel. Now, AMD do not allow motherboard manufacturers to actually do any tweaking for memory. So if you were to complain to, for example, Biostar or whomever that, hey, um, this RAM kit is not working, they actually can't do anything. All they can do is pass your complaint over to AMD, who will then do their damnedest to fix that, and then, of course, include it in a Gasset update. So apparently AMD are doing better with that. However, to be fair, we've already seen this to be accurate over the past, let's say, 12 months or so. And uh, I've actually had a couple of motherboards that I tested. There was an Asus board that I had, an X370, and it was absolutely awful. Like 2133, it was stable, 2400 megahertz. It was like 50-50 if it was going to boot, and so on and so on. It actually made testing the board rather difficult. And so a couple of other vendors actually sent over their boards uh, that we actually used to review Ryzen back in the day. Subsequently, though, the X370 uh, Prime from Asus has uh, received numerous updates, which has made it considerably better and more stable, I have to say. So obviously, that's definitely a positive um, from the perspective of uh, memory support. And in regards to memory, we also, as we know, if you have an X370 motherboard, you can put in a Ryzen 2000 series processor. That's commonly known. And AMD were originally intending to support uh, the Ryzen 3000 series with older generation boards and vice versa. But from what my source has told me, this may not happen. It has not been decided yet. In fact, it's a matter of internal debate between AMD as well as motherboard vendors. Now, you may say to yourself, well, why are they debating this? What's causing them to have this friction? Why are they possibly going to change their mind? Well, there's actually a couple of reasons. The first reason comes down to the size of BIOSes. 
Now, if you cast your mind back several months ago, uh, midpoint this year, there was a piece of news that was going around that AMD, as well as motherboard manufacturers, were dropping support for Bristol Ridge, the Bristol Ridge APUs. <laughs> there was a reason for this. It was the size of the actual BIOSes. Essentially, you only get 16 megabytes for the code to be plonked onto the motherboard. So you can't just have like this never ending list of processes that are supported because if you need to do bug fixes or other changes, eventually you're going to run out of space. And obviously motherboard manufacturers don't want just the basic BIOS. They, they all want it to look as pretty and user friendly as possible. And of course they want automatic overclocking. They want you to be able to like automatically adjust voltages and all of this cool stuff because it just makes their motherboards easier to sell. And obviously for you, it makes them more easy easier to navigate, easier to, easier to use, and just, well, more appealing. So there is some debate there of like, well, how far are we going to go back? Because we don't know how many SKUs there are going to be in the Ryzen 3000 series. But even if we say that there's the same amount of SKUs as the Ryzen 2000 series, because you've got to remember APUs and stuff as well, well, that could certainly be a problem. And so Apparently, some people in AMD, along with motherboard manufacturers, are asking for AMD to not backwardly support the board and to say, no, stop that. And there's also another reason as well. There are also feature sets, uh, sorry, new features that are being added with the Ryzen 3000 series processors. For example, PCIe 4.0, along with the next generation of USB, plus a couple of other things. But the other big thing is the power distribution on the motherboards. So I don't want this to go into a really technical explanation of motherboard phases because quite frankly, it's well outside, outside excuse me, of the remit of this video. But the idea of a motherboard phase is to provide juice to the, to the actual CPU. As you probably know, processors require energy to work, right? But they can't do it from like the 12 volt rail of the, of, of the PSU. So the job of the, um, the job of the actual phases of the motherboard is to essentially convert the power from like the 12 volt rail or the 5 volt rail, that's typically the 12 volt rail, down to a voltage that the CPU can manage, which is generally around 1.2-ish volts. Now, to do that, typically you have multiple phases on a motherboard. You've probably heard of like a four-phase motherboard or an eight-phase motherboard. And the more phases you have, generally speaking, the more reliable and stable a processor is. I say generally speaking, because obviously if you've only got like four processor calls, you're not overclocking, then phases don't matter so much. But if you're going with a higher number of processor calls, you're overclocking, then more phases equals good. Basically, more phases equals a a uh, more stable power distribution to the processor. Because what happens is power goes up and then it goes down. Basically, it, the circuit goes on, then discharges, goes on, then discharges. So uh, I'm putting a, a graph on screen which better uh, illustrates what I'm saying here. So the more phases you have, the smoother the power, um, the smoother the power being fed to the CPU is, which means it's more stable. If you want some type of analogy, the best way I can describe it would be, let's say, similar to how an antibiotic works. There's a reason that they suggest that you take one every, say, four hours. And the reason is half-lifes. After several amount of hours, whatever amount of hours it is, half of that medication has been used in your system. So, for example, if you have a uh, pill that says, let's say, 500 milligrams of a particular medicine after four hours, if that's what the half-life is, well, you now only have 250 milligrams of that uh, particular pill remaining in your system. So what you want to do is keep the levels of that medication as stable as possible. And the same could be said here for, of course, power to the CPU. So that brings us to the reason why this is going to be a problem, and that is the number of processor cores that we're going to find in the next generation of Ryzen processors. So then, why does VRM design of the current motherboards impact the next generation of Ryzen processors? Well, that's because according to my source, AMD will increase the core count for the AM4 platform, and it is going to be to a minimum, I want to repeat that, minimum, of 12 processor cores. Ideally, they are actually shooting for 16 processor cores, which is quite frankly mind-boggling. And it might, it might require them to do significant redesigns to the actual VRMs along with other bits of the motherboard. Because 
what you've got to take into consideration as well is that if you have like a cheap B350 board and then someone says, hey, I've got this board and it says it's compatible with, let's just say for the sake of this video, it's the 3700X, it's a 16 core, they plonk that in, the board could quite literally blow up. Like it could just fry the VRMs, it could possibly even fry the CPU if it just can't handle the power requirements of the chip. And so, you know, there is that to take into consideration. And that's one of the reasons they themselves have not decided whether it's a 12 or 16 core chip. For one, you've got the size issues of the actual die. I'm actually trying to find out more information from my source regarding that. So I'm trying to avoid some of the speculation regarding the actual internal layout of the chip. I'm asking if you can provide more information on that. But in regards to the overall design of the motherboard itself, You've got to take into consideration that, okay, you've got the really high-end motherboards, which might cost several hundred US dollars for the AM4 platform, which obviously have all of the various features that, which would accompany that price point, but they typically also have a lot of phases. So you also need to consider that if you scale that down, inevitably you are going to get customers who buy a cheap motherboard because possibly they don't need all of the frills. They don't need like LED displays. They don't care about, uh, you know, RGB lighting. They don't care about like high-end wireless networking. They don't need a thousand and one PCIe slots. They don't need a trillion and one fan headers, but they just need a decent, stable motherboard. The problem is, as I mentioned earlier, the more VRMs you have, the more stable the power distribution and supply is to the CPU. So what the trick is at the moment, from what my understanding is, uh, from what the source has told me, they need to kind of balance it where you've got a couple of things, obviously, that which produce heat and, well, suck power down. The first, and I'm going to take away the other stuff like memory controllers and caches, and I'm just going to keep things real simple here. But the first is uh, clock speed which obviously the higher the clock speed, depending upon the architecture, the more power that requires and the more uh, heat it produces. And of course, the number of processor cores, which is also a challenge, not only for cooler manufacturers, but also for motherboard vendors as well. So what you've got to take into consideration is that you've got to worry about the actual cooling of the VRMs, making sure that the VRMs themselves, there is enough of them to deal with, let's say a 12-core processor. But you also need to do it in a way where you have a minimum number of VRMs, which is, you know, okay on a certain budget motherboard. So you can't just keep raising the price of motherboards like uh, prices exponentially for the lower end SKU. So that's also something else to take into consideration. But the big issue, of course, is AMD are also trying to figure out the scaling, what the sweet point is between clock speed along with number of processor cores, because obviously clock speed is very important as well. If you have a lower clock speed, then certain tasks, for example, games, which is one of the reasons a lot of competitive CSGO players right now are going for Intel. I mean, a CSGO player, on average, will go with like a 1080p monitor, a high-end graphics card, and a high-end Intel CPU. And the reason is, is that they're trying to get as many frames per second as possible. Ideally, they would like that 240 hertz monitor to be getting 240 hertz, so 240 FPS, so that they have the smallest uh, latency as possible when playing the game. So, obviously, for the most part, games don't really require that, but it is something that AMD as well are taking into consideration because they don't want to necessarily lose to Intel in that arena. They want to be as competitive as possible for gaming. So they want the highest number of cores as possible while maintaining a highest frequency as possible. Inevitably, if I do not uh, tackle IPC in uh, the video, people are going to ask me about it in the comments. Uh, he had told me specifically that 29% IPC gains are definitely achievable in real world scenarios. But like AMD themselves pointed out, it is edge case testing. So it is certainly not indicative of what you would find in most uh, tests, in most benchmarks between, let's say, Zen 1 to Zen 2. Instead, the earlier reported rumor of around 10 to 15 percent IPC gain appears to be more accurate. Uh, once again, it does depend upon the workload, and of course, it does depend upon the variant of uh, Zen that you're comparing it against. So Zen 1, obviously, has a slightly lower IPC than Zen Plus. However, my source also told me that one of the biggest challenges right now for AMD is to improve inter-core communication from various CCXs. 
He did not provide exact information on all of what AMD are doing here, other than some of the more common information, but which we've discussed before. So I'm gonna link that in the video if you're unfamiliar, but basically some improvements to like Infinity Fabric and that type of stuff. Now my source also did tell me a couple of small uh, tidbits regarding AMD's GPUs, Threadripper, as well as Intel. Uh, this stuff is nowhere near as uh, comprehensive, so I'm just gonna fit it into this video. In regards to AMD's GPUs, a GPU will almost certainly launch at Computex 2019. I don't know the specifications because they do not know the specifications themselves. They do not work with AMD's GPU division. All he knows is that from what the marketing over at AMD, along with some of their tech guys have told him, that yes, it is almost certain that there will be a GPU of some description launching and of course, that will be PCIe 4.0. So we can probably presume it's going to be Navi along with what have, whatever uh, variants of Navi that AMD decide to release. In regards to Threadripper, AMD are less decisive on what they're going to be doing. Of course, it's going to support PCIe 4.0 for the X499 platform. But in regards to the actual core count for Ryzen, uh, sorry, for Ryzen Threadripper, they have not yet internally decided whether they're going to increase the number of processor cores or not. It's possible they may stay at 32 cores, 64 threads. Now you're gonna say, well, what gives there? Well, one of the ways they're gonna separate the two product offerings and mean that even if you do have the choice between a 16 core uh, Ryzen processor and a 16 core Threadripper processor, the Threadripper processor does have certain advantages. For one, obviously you've got uh, quad channel memory, and for two, you also have much better I.O. So yes, of course, both uh, platforms do support PCIe 4.0, but you do have the additional lanes thanks to the Threadripper design and the uh, X3, uh, X499 design, excuse me. So that is definitely something that you need to take in consideration. And AMD apparently, once again, is still trying to balance that stuff. And finally, I will also mention that from what he has heard, Intel's Comet Lake is indeed real. If you're unfamiliar with Comet Lake, it is indeed a 10 core uh, processor from Intel, and it will of course be aimed at the mainstream segment of the market, much like let's say the 9900K right now. He is uncertain of the release date. He said it could be late 2019, possibly 2020. He's not 100% certain. But apparently from what he understands, Intel themselves are rather worried about the Zen 2 architecture. He knows that yes, the chip is real. Yes, um, Intel are concerned, but he doesn't know anything about the motherboard design plans. He doesn't know anything about the exact release date. He doesn't know about the performance and he does not know about the rest of the specifications, only that it is a 10 core processor. And once again, that it is roughly scheduled between late 2019 and some point 2020. So I would also like to say that this is an article as well. You can find that linked in the video description description. Now once again the person who told me this information did so with the confidence knowing that I would not reveal who they are, which company they work for, what division they are in, or any other such information. But once again I cannot reveal that information because it would be extremely unfair to the company that they work with and it would also be extremely unfair to the individual who told me the information uh, in confidence. But with that said, I can thank them very much for providing this information to me. And I'd also like to thank you as well, because, well, without you watching the channel, uh, this wouldn't really be a thing and it wouldn't exist. And I would not be able to get this type of information from people. So if you want more information like this, and of course you want me to get more leaks, more sources, more news and more coverage reviews and well, that stuff, you know what you have to do. You have to click the like button, don't you? With all of that said, thank you very much for watching the video. You can also find us on Patreon, which is linked in the description of this video. And you can also find Amazon affiliate links if you want to, that's totally down to you, of course. And once again, this is also an article. So if you prefer to read this in word form, then by all means, you can read the words instead. But for now, I'm gonna get going. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.